some fright fans to the horror story corner. Where tonight we have a fiendishly fear-filled fable penned by me, the caretaker. It concerns a man named Gibson, a solitary man, a boring man. A man whose very existence is sustained by the mundane. That is, of course, until he takes a little fall. Or what seems small at first. However, as our story progresses, he may just find he's taken a tumble right into the deathly corridors of the horror story corner. I hope you enjoy Gibson's Fall. Richard Gibson was a singularly dull individual who accomplished little and aspired to little more. His childhood was ordinary, his work life was monotonous, and his personal life, of the small amount that he had, was boring. It could be said of Gibson that he was so very ordinary that it was almost extraordinary, which makes the peculiar circumstances in the moments leading up to his death so odd in their stark contrast to his everyday life. Years had elapsed between Gibson moving into flat 16B and his ultimate demise. However, the residents of that dilapidated eyesore of a building, nestled cosily between the closed-down steelworks and the crumbling city's red light district, barely knew of his existence. His end began with a fall. Gibson had taken breakfast, toast on wholemeal or no butter, one boiled egg and half a grapefruit at his usual time of 7.30, and had completed this and his black coffee, no sugar, by 7.38. It was a meagre meal, but sufficient in setting up the day. He was a short, thin man, whose body required little in the way of sustenance, and the meal would sate him until his lunch of two cream crackers, no cheese, fifteen grapes, seven green and eight purple, and 200 millilitres of orange juice not from concentrate, no artificial colouring, nor preservatives. Meagre suited him. He wasn't exactly sebophobic, but he did have an unexplained and overwhelming fear of feeling too full. The uncomfortable, aching sickness associated with overgorging oneself was to him the stuff of nightmares. So Meagre was plenty. Once breakfasted, and after the caffeine had started to take effect, he took up his briefcase, placed his neat domed black hat on his head, and slipped on his slender black tie, pulling it so tight that if his neck were but a millimetre more in diameter, he might have throttled himself. As he passed the mirror that hung in the entryway, the only mirror in his apartment besides a small portable one usually found by the sink in the bathroom, he noticed a small crease on his shirt which churned his stomach, and although the thought of being a couple of minutes behind schedule sickened him further, the weight of the crease was heavier. He removed his shirt, and taking a hot iron in hand, repeatedly pressed and steamed it for a full two minutes, inspected it closely in the mirror for a further few minutes before he moved out into the corridor. He would usually leave at 7.40. Today it was 7.48 and it would normally still have been early enough for him to avoid all life inside of his building. However, on this occasion, and for some inexplicable reason other than the will of fate itself, he noted how positively brimming with life it was. The twins from the room two doors down were careering back and forth down the hallway, making a tremendous fuss, giggling and banging their grubby little hands all along the wall as they did. James Herbert, the grocer who lived two floors higher than Gibson, was lugging a huge sack of new potatoes up the stairwell and making quite the clamour about it. He had a total of six floors left to go, and Gibson did not have the slightest inclination to offer him help. There was an obnoxious woman with too large a bosom and a grating voice, speaking loudly in the direction of her husband, a weed of a thing who was one meal away from not existing, Both were stood on the small landing between Gibson's floor and the one below, 
and from above came an annoyingly regular thudding of some elderly gentleman's cane. This unexpected pandemonium served to unsteady Gibson, to the point that he was quite unable to notice the stray toy that the twins had left carelessly at the top of the staircase. And, being in the rush that he was to make up the lost time, he stepped on it quite speedily and with no real way of righting himself. He fell down fifteen steps in total, and in a state of utter confusion and shock, had let his body go limp. This action, as explained to him later by the paramedic, had saved him from some broken bones, although he had sustained a sufficiently nasty abrasion to the head which troubled him enough that he called in sick to work for the day. Dizzy and alone, he spent most of these solitary hours in silence, looking out of his small, dingy window and watching the ever-grey sky. It unleashed torrent after torrent of icy cold rain down onto the umbrella-topped figures darting about below. They hurriedly found their destinations. Then in time, tired of their chosen endeavours before returning through the rain-sodden streets to where they had originated. It was like a sombre, orchestrated dance, beginning and ending in the same way. It reminded Gibson of death and doused his spirit in the kind of dreaded understanding that only humanity shares. Casting his vision away momentarily, he noticed a small leather-bound book on his table that he remembered purchasing, but not placing in that spot, and beside it was a slender blue and silver Parker pen that had been his father's, but which he also did not recall putting on the small table. This only troubled him briefly, but for that brief spell, trouble him it did. He was a meticulous man when it came to keeping order in his abode, and the fact that he could not remember putting an item in a specified location was a worry. However, he soon put this down to the nasty knock on his head, and resisted the urge to leaf through the pages of the book. Even if there was an odd compulsion gnawing at him, telling him there was something important, that had been recently committed to its pages. It was here, then, that Gibson first began to detect a slight buzzing or ringing, or rather something quite a lot unlike either, but so quiet or indistinct that it was almost beyond perception, let alone loud enough to accurately describe. Once he had perceived it, though, it may well have been deafening, or at least to the proportions that it seemingly later became. He was immediately frustrated by the sound and could do little to distract himself from it. He tried to turn on his radio to drown and wait it out, but knowing that the sound was there, underneath it, was as troubling as the sound itself. He shut off the radio and began to pace his small apartment. He noticed that, stood or sat, and when moving to the farthest left or the farthest right of the apartment, the noise remained precisely the same. He covered his ears with his hands, and then he plunged his neatly trimmed but skeletal fingers into them, and both times the noise stopped, replaced by the usual cupped ear sound as if one were under water. However, he couldn't determine if it had actually stopped, meaning that the noise was external, or if the sound of the cupping was enough to disguise or mute the other. Obsessed and increasingly panicked by the steady, unceasing and near-silent sound, he lifted the receiver of his landline, a grey, no-frills object, with uninteresting push-buttons, and dialed the number of his local GP. The sound of the dial tone, the beeping of the buttons being pushed, and the ringing of the phone again disguised the frustrating drone but the moment he removed the speaker from his ear, it was there, unchanged and continuous. Good morning, Woodland View Medical Practice, answered a voice far too chirpy for a rainy Thursday afternoon in November. Dr. Mukherjee, please, requested Gibson, not impolitely. What is this regarding, sir? At this, Gibson considered his response, and decided that a slight almost imperceptible noise so soon after a head trauma was perhaps 
no real reason to interrupt a busy doctor's schedule. He apologised for any trouble his call may have caused, and then returned the receiver to its cradle. The noise was still present, but he figured, from a more rational standpoint, that it was either external, in which case it would cease eventually, or if it were a result of the fall, it should resolve itself given enough time. If that were not the case, then he could always contact the good doctor at a later point. The light grew dimmer outside, and it made Gibson tired, but he wouldn't sleep yet. Whilst the paramedics hadn't specifically told him he should abstain, he wanted to ensure he would again wake. So instead he turned on the television. There was some slow cooking show that made him even more tired on the one channel, and a pop music chart show on the other, which made him promptly turn the set off again. Instead, he thumbed the radio into life and listened to Tom Edwards for several hours. As the dimness gave way to twilight, and the twilight morphed into a thick darkness, Gibson decided that he should be safe enough to rest. And whilst the noise was still present, he found it easy in his worn-out state to drift into a swift slumber, pleased that the resulting sleep would obscure the sound, at least for a time. But the satisfaction did not remain with him throughout the whole of the night. It woke him. The red numbers of his clock stood out in the darkness, and whilst he found the brightness crass, he had to admit, in the early hours, it was more practical than his beloved analogue carriage clock. It was four minutes past three, and the sound had grown just loud enough to disturb him. Not yet loud enough to have any true distinctiveness, but certainly an unquestionable fact now. Certainly real. He tried to force the noise away. Again, he plugged up his ears with his fingers, then with earbuds. Then he tried to cover it with the television and the radio, which so happened to be playing his favourite record. It called out to him like a siren song, trying to lull him, trying to tell him to rest. But it did not have the usual stirring and quelling effect. He tried fruitlessly to force more sleep, to make it through the night. But he knew that just underneath the everything that he had conjured to mask and stifle that singular, continuous noise, it remained. This became maddening, all-consuming, the only thing that Gibson could focus upon. So he shut it all off, he shut it all down, and instead he went to sit by the window as he had done earlier in the day. He pulled up one of his two cheap wooden chairs, the other was completely unused but reserved, just in case, and he looked at the small table with the black notebook and the pen that he hadn't placed. Again, this was momentarily distracting, and again he felt that he should open it and read and explore its mystery, but a dark dread set in and stopped the thought dead. He felt flushed, hot, and a little breathless, so he propped the window open to let in the rain-cooled night air, and as he did, something miraculous happened, something that relieved Gibson in an instant. But being the cautious creature that he was, he did not accept the relief completely until he had sufficient proof. He closed the window and then opened it again. He repeated this three times with a short pause each time after it was closed and then opened. When the window was closed, the noise reduced in volume, became minute, barely perceivable. 
But when the window opened, it became detectably different, more solid and less like a singular ring or drone, but something composed of more than one single note. After his short test, Gibson was greatly pleased, for the affected volume by the opening and closing of the window told him one definite truth. The noise was extraneous, and therefore was not related to the hitting of his head. It was not imagined or a symptom of the fall. It was coming from an unspecified region off in the distance, and more important than this, he was becoming ever more certain as he held his head out of the window, icy droplets of rain flicking onto the larger protuberances of his countenance, that this sound was some kind of music. Of the origin, type, instrument, one or many, he was uncertain, but there were almost the makings of a melody that was carried across to him on that sodden night's air. Satisfied and chilled by bitter winds, Gibson closed the window and returned to his bed. The clock seared 4.52am into his vision, and as he lay his head onto the pillow, he noticed a marked return of the dizziness he had felt earlier in the day. The music through the closed window became a singular hum once more, but one that was no longer quite as unpleasant, although it was annoying to him that it should have lasted for so long. There was a peace in knowing that its source might be explored rationally, should it refuse to quieten. He closed his eyes, and an embrace of slumber came on immediately. At 6.30am, Gibson awoke to hear the sound very much unchanged, annoying but tolerable and ignorable. What was not bearable, however, was his dizziness. It had remained, worsened even, and so he called into work and requested the remainder of the week off. He stated he was willing to use his holiday entitlement to cover the absence, but having never taken a day of leave for sickness, or for a break in the many years he had worked for the company, he was told that he needn't bother, and that he should remain at home until he was well enough to be back at work. The sentiment touched him. Gibson had had very few connections in his life, but he was a loyal man, loyal to his company and to his work, and it was nice that, whilst he had made no friends or even so much as an acquaintance, he was noticed and he was appreciated. He turned over, closed his eyes, and let unconsciousness take him. At 9.12 a.m. he breakfasted on a singular piece of brown toast, no butter, 200 millilitres of orange juice, not from concentrate, and an egg boiled. The weather had settled, and now, and even with the window closed, Gibson could detect differing characteristics within the sound. So much so that he again opened the window, and leant out above the street. The distance down to the ground, and the sudden feeling of how easy it would be to let himself fall, made him slightly queasy. There was a rush of something like adrenaline and a small voice that wasn't serious but told him to let himself go. This made him recoil and nudge the small oak table. As he did, he almost disturbed the stern-looking notepad and pen which remained in their unconsciously placed state. And the action, for some inexplicable reason, filled him with an incomprehensible horror. But... It wasn't disturbed, and the feeling soon faded as his attention once more centred on the bizarre noise. He closed his eyes and took in more of it now that the rain had ceased and the wind had slowed. It was certainly music, and seemingly from a lone instrument, although he could not determine the type. It was still too slight, and he was not an aficionado. There was no singing, no voice just a melody, but so whisper-thin that it could barely be understood, barely commented on, barely taken in by the listener, and this frustrated him. There was, however, something recognisable about it. Perhaps it was a piece that he knew. He figured that its mystery was probably no more than a radio tuned to the third programme, classical, 
now named BBC Radio 3, and left on by some forgetful owner. The increase in volume could be put down to the listener increasing it manually the night before, and by the alteration in the weather this morning and nothing more. He thumped on the radio. His favourite song returned, and his stomach turned, slightly, at the oddity that it should still be playing. He shut it off, closed the window, and walked from one end of his small apartment to the other. He was still slightly dizzy, so he took up a place in his most comfortable seat, a fabric armchair, and decided to spend the day making up for the ridiculous sum of 72 guineas that he had forked out for his Murphy television set. They had sold them in many colours, including a ridiculous red. The adverts proclaimed that they did this to draw attention to its wonderful speaker system, and Gibson had to agree the sound quality was suitably pleasing, but he would not buy something in such a horribly overwhelming shade. He had opted for white, and that was fine. He spent hours flitting between the few stations without really noticing the programmes. Maybe the Love Boat, maybe the Incredible Hulk were on at points he didn't know. His mind was with the sound outside and with his work. He didn't like taking time off. He didn't know what to do with it. He couldn't relax and had spent much of his time avoiding the regular pursuits of his peers. He was not interested in sports, not overly into art or the theatre. He wouldn't often watch films or television. He would wake, work, tire, eat and sleep. The only occasional pleasures he would allow himself were books and music, and of those he was only interested in a limited number. He'd never been fascinated by women, nor did he believe that he would ever fall in love with one. Not again, anyway. He had only ever been with one lover, and had tried onanism twice, and although he did find a relief in it, the action itself was too crass and too shame-filled for him to repeat for a third time. He was repressed and dull, and that too was fine. He prepared a late dinner after not taking lunch, and left the plate in the kitchen whilst he switched between the television and the radio. There was nothing but static in the place of his usual favourite station, and after adjusting the dial to find nothing, he sighed and let the static fill the corners of that small, cold apartment. It echoed from the wood-panelled lower walls and nestled all along the cheap, heavily painted clothing. It found cracks and holes behind the peeling, dreary brown wallpaper to enter and hide within. Gibson took his plate and was moving over to the table when a single voice called out above the static. Oh, nobody else gave me a thrill With all your faults I love you still It had to be you He dropped the plate at the sudden shock of hearing that voice unaccompanied by a melody. The resulting clamour chased it away and brought back the static, and after staring dumbly for a moment, Gibson left the dinner soaking into the old but heavily vacuumed brown carpet and switched the radio off with perspiring fingers. As he did, the noise from outside of the building returned, no longer disguised by the artificial sounds of his apartment, and for the very first time since he had heard it, he started to recognise it, or rather, he thought he did. The tune was jaunty, yet sad, fast-paced, but haunting, light-hearted, but something that encouraged the listener to fall in love. His synapses were firing, it was on the tip of his tongue, but he just couldn't call it to memory. Sidestepping his dinner, which was still being hungrily absorbed by the thick pile, he moved to and opened the window. Again he felt a rush and an urge, 
when he saw the hard pavement sprawling out below, which he ignored, and instead he tried to focus on the sound, which was markedly louder now than it had been earlier. It was no use, however. It was still ever so slightly too faint for him to capture the memory of the melody, though he was suddenly struck by the fact it seemed very similar to the music he had heard at 9am that morning, and slowly began to consider that it might not be a radio, for what radio station, besides his, it seemed, would play the same music over and over from morning until evening? This he pondered long after he had tidied away his dinner, long after he had drained his cup of tea, milk, no sugar, which had served as a replacement for his meal, long after he had quietened the noise by closing out the cool night, and long after he had climbed onto his mattress and pulled up the covers tightly to his neck. The thoughts even followed him into dreams. It had to be you. He woke with a start as the early morning sun had just begun peeking underneath the edges of his simple wooden blind. He threw the covers back, leaving them in a state that would have driven him to madness mere days before, and without removing his pyjamas and dressing into something entirely more appropriate, he threw open those same blinds and lifted the window. The sound hit him immediately, louder than it had been the night before, so that now he was utterly convinced of exactly what tune it was. Placing the words to the melody, he whispered out into the newly forming day, It had to be you. Wonderful you. It had to be you. It fit, and he took on a grim pallor as he shut the window once more and flung the blind back down, and he eyed the radio and furtively moved towards it. He placed his forefinger and thumb on the dial and twisted it into horrific life. And there it was. Without thinking, he picked up the radio and threw it with something that wasn't rage, but not far from it, a kind of angry, shocked terror. It smashed and was silence for good. But that melody, still calling from somewhere off in the distance, remained. It tapped at his windows and circumnavigated the blinds. It shook the stiff air until it vibrated in his ears. And though still delicate and weak, it may have well sounded like a foghorn for it would have produced the same delirium-inducing effect on Gibson. In that moment he lost himself, and there came a sudden, merciful, black reprieve where he could remember little of his actions. When he came back to his senses, however, he stood in a ransacked flat, wallpapers torn from their place, one dining chair strewn and the other in splinters. Jars and plates and shards of glass adorned the kitchen, which was actually more of a single counter at the end of his living room, and the television was face down on the floor. In fact, the only thing in view that had not been touched was the oak table, and upon which, still immaculately placed, was the heavy black notebook and the Parker pen beside it. Shaken and dazed by his own outburst, Gibson fumbled through the wreckage for his phone. He found it in quite the state, and was surprised that once he had plunged it back into the wall, he heard the familiar lifeless dial tone ring out like a flat line. He thumbed in the numbers. This is a pre-recorded message. I'm sorry, but the surgery is now closed. Please call back during normal working hours. The dead voice sounded. It was Saturday. He had forgotten that. He couldn't contact the doctors again till Monday. He would have to wait it out. And he did, sitting stoically on his one remaining dining chair, the armchair having been upturned and roughhoused so badly that the springs were visible from every angle. But as he did, that music increased and became clearer until he could tell that the instrument was some lone acoustic guitar. The strings were being lazily yet unceasingly plucked by ethereal fingers, and their sound was carried straight to him. 
then started an irrational hatred and a series of thoughts. How dare this faceless, nameless player destroy his peace? How dare they continue to play his song until he could stand to hear it no longer? Occasionally the thought of his own radio would seep into his mind, the uncanny nature of the song playing each time it came to life. This told his rational mind that perhaps the fall had damaged something after all, and conceivably this was all an illusion brought on by some bizarre swelling of his brain. Gibson pushed these thoughts aside, however. They were scarier than obsessing over the sound of the guitar, and there was a single-minded solace in growing ever more furious at its player. Surely he was not the only one outraged. It was true the sound was far from deafening or anywhere near a level to be deemed a nuisance, but it was incessant, unending, and therefore infuriating. On Sunday morning, and after gaining not a moment's rest, Gibson suddenly struck upon an idea. The Little Bailey Theatre, down Bailey Road. It was just two streets over, and they regularly put on shows that featured dancing, singing, and music. It was plausible that, should the sound system have been changed or improved, the music might reach him, and someone may have been practicing the song, perfecting it for some upcoming performers, or even more likely, it was some pre-recorded tape that had simply been repeating over and over in the theatre owner's absence. That was it! That must be it! thought Gibson, and in a state of frenzy brought on by the lack of sleep and obsession with the intrusive sound, he dressed quickly and ran out of the building in the direction of the small playhouse. The theatre was unimpressive, standing on a dreary grey road in a decaying city. It leaned against the surrounding buildings as though it may collapse without them. The windows were fogged, bordered and covered in a thick grime. The doors were splintered, with their once beckoningly scarlet paint flaking off in great chunks and impressing upon the senses a feeling of leprous disease. It was a tired and near-condemned building, and if the city's officials had given a damn about their rotting carcass of town, they may have pulled it down as a danger or an eyesore many years ago. But for now, it remained, barely alive, barely holding itself together and hardly frequented. Out in the cool air of the early Sunday morning, Gibson roused a little, and as he approached the structure, he could have sworn that the sound of the music intensified, making him surer of his earlier assumptions. He thundered several knocks against the pair of fractured wooden doors, which were far taller and carved more intricately than they had any right to be and he continued to rain down mighty blows on the shuddering wood until a diminutive figure with some difficulty pulled one of the doors open. Gibson moved inside abruptly, which shocked the short, balding and slightly tubby man who looked nothing like but somehow reminded Gibson of Andy Cap. "'What's this, then? What's the meaning?' fumbled the short figure, trying to understand the nature of his caller and to ascertain the level of threat. "'Where's it coming from?' demanded Gibson." with no attempt at niceties. Sir, stated the small theatre dweller, finding his voice, it is a Sunday and the theatre is closed. I'm afraid you're going to have to leave. If you have any queries about supporting the theatre or around any of our future shows, then you will have to contact us during our regular opening hours. Who are you? demanded Gibson, seemingly ignoring everything the man had said. Roger Arnold. I own this theatre, and as I say, we are closed. Turn off the music, ordered Gibson, unexpectedly, to which the theatre owner had no immediate reply. Gibson then specified, The music. I want you to stop it. It has been days, and I can hear it two streets away. Turn it off now. You must hear it. Confused, Mr. Arnold stated, But there is no music. There hasn't been any music played in this theatre for months now. And at this, Gibson became enraged, letting out a torrent of abuse at the poor bewildered man, and with a final demand to cease the constant and incessant playing of the dreaded spectral guitar, Gibson struck Mr. Arnold with the back of his hand. Quickly, this sobered Gibson and as he looked down at the thin coating of blood that stained the ring on his index finger, he felt a swell of regret and shame. 
I'm sorry, murmured Gibson, in far too low a tone for the theatre owner to hear. And in a stupor, he made his way back to his apartment building, realising that he must have been mistaken, that he had convinced himself of the origin of that horrible music without solid evidence. For now, as he made his way up the staircase of his residence, he realised that the sound was distant, very distant, and terribly loud. Loud enough, so that it may be heard from many miles away. Loud enough so it could stalk him, just him. Considering the distance between him and its source and the mystery and the unceasing nature made him feel sick, and he stormed into his apartment, shutting out the world with a tremendous thud of his door. Back in his living room, the music didn't relent. If anything, it became louder, clearer and more maddening. Each note was slowly and carefully placed, but his mind took them and sped them up, turning them into bedlam, chaos and turmoil. Then, and causing Gibson to fall from his one remaining chair, his smashed and broken radio burst into life, and there she was, singing to him again. Marion Harris's beautiful tones, now clawing at his eardrums like the most vicious of talons. Nobody else gave me a thrill. With all your faults, I love you still. It had to be you, wonderful you. After the initial shock morphed into an ever-deepening indignation, Gibson stood, marched over to the radio and stamped whatever remaining life it had out of it. And even though it yielded instantly, there was no relief because that same tune continued somewhere unseen, somewhere off in the distance. And unknown to him, he pulled the chair up to the window, moving the table with the undisturbed and heavy black book lay on top, with its accompanying pen carefully placed to the right-hand side, and opening the window he looked out over the gloom of the city. He was transfixed by the sound. He was growing both angrier but also something else, something he hadn't noticed before but which was slowly becoming apparent to his senses. He was yearning. His whole body, perhaps his spirit or soul or something akin to both, started to ache for the music and he experienced a strange combination of both hatred and a deep longing. The longing intensified, allowing the notes of that hidden instrument to hypnotise and to mesmerise, and seemingly without conscious instruction, his body began to move. It felt strange. The kind of floaty, non-committal movement that occurs only in dreams. He was moving forwards, but it felt much more like being suspended than walking. Indeed, he hardly felt like an entire human composition, but more like a drifting consciousness led by the beckoning call of the music. He whispered, It had to be you. It had to be you. I wandered around and I finally found somebody who could make me be true and could make me be blue and even be glad just to be sad thinking of you. And the words were electricity. They danced from his throat and dived off from his tongue into the thickening purple haze which surrounded his form. Only at very rare intervals did Gibson notice portions of the real world. There were the stairs of his apartment block, the rain-soaked road which ran parallel to his building, the small theatre where he had assaulted Mr. Arnold, and then streets he hadn't wandered, and fragments of buildings he hadn't seen, then endless portions of darkness broken by occasional glances of an impossibly starry sky, before plunging again into darkness as deep as death. Finally, the outline of a house, but bigger, a manor, a mansion, huge and imposing, grand yet dilapidated, and shrouded in an air of something which felt unspeakably cold and foreboding. There was the click of a door handle, the thud of heavy wood, and the music, louder than it had ever been, consuming all five senses so that he could taste the words and smell the melody, overwhelming and intoxicating. Then he roused. He came to, and his heart was a jackhammer against his chest. 
A prickling of fear seized his stomach, and he found it difficult to maintain a steady breath. He found himself before two large doors, wooden, but with an odd shimmering purple sheen to them. They were carved and seemed to contain outlines of humanoid-style figures, but their mouths had been scratched away. Below the figures, someone had written, I know they have mouths. They will use them to consume the earth. Gibson tried to piece together his journey to this door to remember what had led him to this place, but beyond the lingering longing for the music and the fragments aforementioned, he could not define the force that had guided him. And whilst his journey had felt somewhat like a dream, the dreaminess had ended sharply, and reality had seized him in an icy vice-like grip before this door. Beyond it, the music sounded more powerfully with its slow and deliberately placed notes. He reached out shakily and placed his hand on the handle of one of the two great doors. A shimmer of something close to but unlike colour cascaded over the surface as he pushed forward and the door began to move. It took Gibson some moments to comprehend what he was looking at, and a memory of Paris pulled at his mind, back before the monotony, before she had left him. He had visited the catacombs and seen the long hallways of death. The floor of the room to which the large door had led was carpeted in a similar death, but the bones here were far worse, far more indicative of unordered chaos and a lurking danger. In the catacombs there had been a purpose, a reason for their movement, and they were arranged, cared for. Here it was anarchy, they lay in a chalky mass, each one sprawled as though they had been catapulted across the room rather than laying where they had fallen, and above them rose the loud, preternatural plucking of that hellish guitar. The bones were predominantly intact, with no visible breakage that may present a clear cause of death. The skeletons, though strewn, were complete, and amongst the sea of bones, like a leather-bound island, rose a tall Chesterfield armchair which faced a curtained window. Gibson shuffled through the bones, being careful not to raise his feet so that he might not step on and desecrate the remains, but he had to wade through them. For on the other side of that large chair, which while so everyday took on strange and impossible but hard-to-perceive characteristics, was the source of the music, and it pulled at him hard. As he moved closer to the chair, he noticed that some of the bones retained flesh and could not have been here for very long at all. In fact, the closer he moved to the chair, the fresher the bodies, until they were not skeletal at all, but fully formed corpses with horrific looks of anguish stretched across their tight leathery faces, and whilst their numerous expirations indicated a similar fate for himself, he choked aside fear, and was overcome by need for the palpable notes. He pressed forward. As he reached the chair, he took a fleeting glance back at the door and considered leaving the mystery and the need to solve it unsated. This was a fallacy, however, an illusion. He could no sooner leave than he could refrain from breathing. It was compulsion now. It was need. He moved around the chair and manoeuvred himself so that he could see the incessant musician. In the chair sat a poor and withered ghoul. Its skin was taut and thin, bluish and mottled. Some of the fresher corpses by this unfortunate soul's feet seemed to retain more life in their limbs than it did. Of gender, Gibson could not tell. Anything that may indicate such a thing had long collapsed to dust. The eyes were still fully formed, but yellowing with thick, dark, branch-like veins covering them. The expression of the face was completely set and unmoving in an unspeakable terror. But it was undoubtedly living. Its fingers, if you could call the splintered, bloody and receding stumps fingers, were playing the notes that had been driving Gibson to insanity. On it played, the strings making the raw tips of its fingers splinter further. Then, fixing a lidless, bulging gaze directly at Gibson, it spoke. Please! it hissed and choked. Please take it, take it from me! And with these words, the guitar, a rudimentary piece of wood, but with the same shimmering purple that Gibson had noticed glimmering at the entrance to this room, was held out towards him. 
He could hear it. It was singing directly to him, and the melody had once again become pleasing. The instrument sang those familiar words. It had to be you. He closed his eyes and listened to the tune, and danced again like he once had when the world had a fire to it, and his heart had passion. He saw the endless moonlit nights of his youth, and the wonderful opportunities before life became empty, numbing, and tiring. All you have to do, called a voice from beyond that enchanting moonlight, is play. Play with all that you are. Play your song. Your soul's song. Play it. And you will feel alive again. You will feel alive. Forever. With a sudden terror, Gibson realized he was mere inches from taking the demonic guitar into his hands, and he recoiled backwards in horror, falling against and disturbing the thick curtains which kept the room drenched in gloom. No! Keep them shut! cried the corpse-like ghoul from the Chesterfield as the curtain was disturbed, and feeling the dark force which permeated the room pulse with fear, Gibson turned towards the window and cast them open, drenching the place in light. He awoke in his room, his head pounding at the spot he had struck when falling down the stairs. At first there was a euphoria, an ecstasy of escaping his grim fate. His mind swam with her, with passion, with a full life left to live. But this all sank as the music returned calling out from that darkened hall and secluded mansion just behind reality. And, though he wished more than anything to dismiss the memories of the room with an entire cemetery for a carpet, as the pure fiction of his disoriented and dreaming mind, he could not. He knew it was real, and it waited for him. The music continued for days, for weeks, and with each note Gibson wanted to give in, he wanted to seek the guitar once more. He wanted to feel it pressed against his own fingers, and feel the strings tearing his flesh from his bones. He wanted to feel the fire of the earth, the passion in the mantle. He wanted to be burned alive and consumed. He envied the withered ghoul who had chosen pleasure until death, and all of the others that made up that room's macabre tapestry. But then rationality would return, and it would say that it wasn't worth his soul, that it was a trick, and there was nothing in the music but agony. He wrestled within his own mind, each passing second, almost unending. He didn't eat, he didn't sleep, he was turning it over and over. Then he decided. He looked at the black book on the table, finally understanding its reason for being. He took the pen into his hand and wrote dedicating every mark to one person who he knew would never see the words. He wrote a beautifully tender goodbye which made him feel something so pure and so white-hot that he knew he'd made the right decision. He knew that upon saving his soul, it may someday have the chance to rejoin hers. It had to be you, he wrote. Wonderful you. And with that... He opened his small ninth-story window and jumped out of it. Richard Gibson died as soon as he hit the pavement. Police responding to the emergency calls of onlookers forcibly entered his flat and conducted interviews with several members of the apartment building. The following is what they discovered. That morning, Gibson had left his lodgings, as was his usual habit. However, he took a nasty fall over a toy left at the top of the stairs. Paramedics attended the scene and found him lucid and well, with a minor abrasion to the head. He was advised to rest, and taking this advice, he returned to his rooms, alone. He was not seen again until three hours later, falling to his death from his window. Nothing inside of Gibson's flat was out of the ordinary excepting two peculiarities. A record by Marion Harris was repeating on a small record player, the line, it had to be you, wonderful you, playing over and over. 
The second, and somewhat disturbing, was a black leather-bound notebook that was found on the table beside the window where Gibson had fallen to his death. In it, Gibson had detailed fantastic events that had happened since his fall down the stairs, where he'd struck his head. Events which have been presented to the reader as a narrative in the text above. However, these events did not span the three hours that all who had seen the incident had suggested had passed between the occurrence and his death. From Gibson's perspective, the events took place over the course of several weeks, perhaps even months. It should be noted that there is no evidence that Gibson ever again left his flat after hitting his head, or that the ramblings found within the notebook are any more than a fanciful mind in the full throes of a madness brought on by the sudden shock of his fall. However, there was one further detail that brings a slight unease to these events, and a chilling realism to the words Gibson committed to the pages before casting himself out of that window. Three days following Gibson's suicide, a small theatre owner, Mr Arnold, called the local police station to report physical assault. When he gave his statement, he spoke of a man who, on that very morning, and in a fit of rage, demanded the theatre cease the constant and incessant playing of a dreaded spectral guitar. When the theatre owner had attempted to reason with him, and explained that no music had been played in his theatre for weeks, the man's fury rose to a tempest, and he struck Mr. Arnold hard with the back of his hand. His ring had caused a small cut to Mr. Arnold's cheek. After this, the man mumbled something, and then fled. Astonishingly, Mr. Arnold's description of the man in question had alarming similarities with the size and countenance of the late Richard Gibson. Well, what do we think? A descent into madness, perhaps. But then, how did the events at the theatre, which Gibson described in his journal, still take place? A conundrum, and maybe one only Gibson himself can answer. However, he's a little tied up at the moment, dancing an endless waltz, to it had to be you. Feel free to join him any time you venture into the horror story corner. For now, however... And, as always, sleep well.